Good evening and welcome to Chasing the Facts. And with us this evening is State Representative Simon Cataldo. How are you, Simon? I'm doing great, Sam. Good, and all, as always, good to have you on the show, and we're looking forward perhaps to getting some uh, legislative updates from you. Um, uh, what I do want to do is just remind the viewers that uh, we have three state representatives that represent the town of Chelmsford, and Simon is one of those state reps. And his district is the 14th Middlesex. And that uh, is made up of uh, precincts 1, 2, 6, and 7 in Acton, precincts 1, 2, and 5 in Concord, the entire town of Carlisle, and precincts 7 through 11 in Chelmsford. So that's uh, quite an expansive district, and we're very, very glad that you are state reps. I'm going to uh, do something a little bit different on tonight's show and something that I've never ever done before. But uh, I would like to take a moment and address the situation, the recent events that have occurred in the Middle East. And uh, I think it's important for me to make a statement because I feel so strongly about this. And I also uh, would like to get the benefit of Simon's thinking on this since he is uh, tied very closely into the Jewish community. And I think it's very appropriate while we have him here to take the opportunity. So let, let's, let's go with that. <clears throat> Hindsight is 2020. Many Americans often look back at the Holocaust and wonder how the world could have been so completely oblivious and slow to react to Nazi Germany's so-called final solution. How could the United States and others have been so indifferent by turning away Jewish refugees? thereby forcing them to stay in places where the oppressor occupiers were determined to kill them. Most Americans today would like to believe that had they been there, they would have stood up against Hitler's demented Nazi regime. On October 7, 2024, the world got the lesson yet again. The maniacs who are determined to obliterate the Jewish Free State of Israel, and more broadly, to kill as many Jews as possible, struck again. This time by killing and capturing innocent Israeli citizens in an attempt to inflict as much pain, horror, and fear on the Jewish people as possible. That is the stated objective of the terrorist organization called Hamas and its collateral extremist organization Hezbollah. They will not be content until every Jew is eradicated from the face of the earth. Make no mistake, these terrorist groups do not in any way represent those innocent Palestinians who only want to live undisturbed and peaceful lives. There is absolutely no, quote, moral equivalency or possible excuse that can be put forth to justify the unprovoked, dastardly, barbaric assault that occurred against the Jewish people on that fateful Saturday. That was Israel's Pearl Harbor, and a day that will surely live in infamy. In a 1948 speech to the British House of Commons, Winston Churchill said, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. While the world breathlessly watches this repeat of 1940s Nazi anti-Jewish atrocities, who now is willing to stand up against the forces of evil? Who now is staying oddly silent or even making excuses for them? The Jewish people will continue to exist as they have throughout their persecuted history for over 6,000 years. The unpleasant fact is that those who want to kill all Jews will also exist. I will always stand by the state of Israel and I will always support any effort to resist the forces of evil trying to erase it and the Jewish people from the face of the earth. And I call on all moral, decent, freedom-loving people in the world to do the same. Your microphone, sir. Thank you, Sam. You had told me before that we'd be discussing this. I didn't know what you were going to say. 
And I'm very- And that's the truth. <laughs> I'm very, very grateful for your words. And you just did something that so few of our leaders have done in any area, in academics, in civic life, in government, elected officials. You said the word Jew. So many of these statements, just days after this brutal terrorist attack, designed to eliminate Jews mm -hmm. and the only Jewish state, Israel, didn't even say the word Jew. Mm -hmm. It's almost unfathomable. And yet, these are the leaders of some of our most so-called elite academic institutions. These are elected leaders. And it is hard to fathom. And yet, and yet, as you mentioned, for most Jews, sadly, unsurprising. Mm -hmm. We have been blamed for our own murder for thousands of years. And here we are again. Here we are again. Um, there's another word you mentioned that is not typically mentioned in statements from leaders and critical for us right now, morality. I'm old enough to remember, Sam, we, you and I come from different generations, but I'm old enough to remember a time when you could say that something was evil and not have people with degrees from Harvard explaining to you why it's actually a cycle of violence. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm old enough to remember a time when your parents could teach you that this was right and this was wrong and not need a 500 word essay to explain that to you. But now we live, we seem to live in this world where large segments of the population, including unfortunately so many leaders, have accepted moral relativism. Mm -hmm. One of the most dangerous things to our society. Mm -hmm. If we have no moral backbone, if we can't call Hamas what it is, then in moments of crisis, we will collapse upon ourselves. For the Jewish people, as you correctly noted, we're in a moment that might determine our continued existence. For America writ large, I view this as a test case will we name what is wrong and support what is right and what is decent? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know where we're going to go. I am incredibly grateful for the leaders across the ideological, ideological spectrum that have stood up and done the right thing and said the right thing. I wish I could say that we were talking about 80% of those leaders, but it is, it is far left. Um, there was a, there's a, a professor from Harvard, Henry Louis Gates, and he, he said, you know, something to the effect of patriotism is about auto critique. And so I can sit here and, and admit- I'm not even sure what that means. Well, well, you know, it's, we have to be able to look inside our own walls, mm -hmm. our own society, and look at what's wrong and what we need to mm -hmm. do better. Okay. That, that, part, that is part of patriotism. Yes, I agree. Right? And, and, and I'm willing to say, you know, as a Democrat, that there is large segments of my, the people who have, hold the same party affiliation who either seem unwilling or unable to locate any sense of a moral backbone or moral clarity. Um, and that is something that's very mm -hmm. concerning to me as a parent, you know, as a father, as, as a husband, uh, as an elected official, and, and certainly as a Jewish person. I, I think your reaction is entirely appropriate. And for those who don't know, um, <clears throat> maybe not the entire population is on Facebook, but I think probably most are. Uh, Simon posted uh, something the other day, a statement uh, that went into much more detail than you've just heard now, but it is one of the best 
It is one of the best summaries and explanations I think I, I've ever seen in encapsulating what you've just said and other things ab about this particular issue and the problem. And as I said, I don't, look, I don't pretend to be an expert in anything, but I've had a fascination with history. That's one of my, one of my hobbies. And I have spent quite a bit of time uh, studying the, uh, the Jewish uh, history uh, since really the, the re recorded uh, times, about 6,000 years is, is generally accepted. And anybody who does that, cannot possibly, cannot possibly understand and not understand what is going on. And as you said, um, okay, it's probably better than it was in the Middle Ages, but we're, st we're still not where we need to be uh, with regard to the way uh, uh, the Jewish people are viewed in the world. And it's very, very troubling uh, to me. So um, I have to say, and of course, you know that you and I don't necessarily same, share the same political views on, on things, but I have to say <clears throat> I was heartened to hear the president's uh, initial reaction, his speech that he made the other night. I thought, uh, you know, and it, maybe it could have been stronger, but I thought uh, given the backdrop of some of the folks in his party, I thought his speech was was pretty good, okay, I agree. and uh, I was very, very pleased. And uh, let's give credit where credit is due. And I think what you were watching, uh, one of the criticisms that we've had of President Biden is that, you know, he really isn't uh, on his game and he's being led by the nose and, and he's not really the president and people are, and who, who knows, I'm, I'm not gonna go there. But what I saw the other night in his speech, that was Joe Biden. And I think he, I think what you heard him say was coming from his heart, and he was really expressing how this wasn't just a government uh, a speech. He was expressing how he really felt about the issue, and I, th I think that came through in his speech. And I was very, very, very pleased uh, to hear him, his remarks. Very happy about that. So let's hope that uh, this situation will resolve. And to me, the resolution is uh, Israel defends itself and sends a very, very clear message to the terrorist organizations that you, you just, you know, don't do this again and don't trifle with us because we're going to do whatever it takes to protect our sovereignty and our identity as, as, as a people. And that's what they need to do. And I hope the United States is going to stand by them with whatever assistance they need. So. Thank you. Okay. Well, so other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you like the play? Well, the good <laughs> news is, Sam, there's a lot of good things to talk about in state government. I hope so. I um, hope so. I don't know where you want to start, but there are so many, so many I, good things going it's on. It's your show. You start. All okay. Right. I mean, you have the outline, and I just do that really to keep me yeah. on topic, but... You and I don't seem to really need this, so, you know, you, you go. Sam, I think every time that I've been on your show, yep. and I love coming on this show, we've talked about Chapter 7. Oh, yes, we have. <laughs> so this is the first time we can say something's actually been done about it. We got an 18% increase in Chapter 70 funding for Chelmsford specifically. Phenomenal. Um, Sorry to say that's not the case. In most municipalities, got 1% or 2%. Mm -hmm. We got an 18% increase, almost $2 million increase for Chapter 70. For those, your viewers probably all know, but for those of, mm -hmm. uh, who don't know, um, that it concerns the state funding for local public school districts. Yep. And that was long overdue. And we won't stop there, but that was a major win in the state budget. Now, let me ask you a little bit about that because, uh, again, I don't know the specifics. I mean, I, I knew the number because I had discussed it with the town manager, but, <clears throat> What we've said for many, many years is we thought that there was an equity in the distribution formula uh, relative to the, num the school population in Chelmsford relative to the surrounding towns and the relative wealth factors, which is part of the formula. And the example I've always given is uh, the town of Westford by both uh, real estate uh, measures and by income measures is, is a richer town than Chelmsford, but they get three times the Chapter 70 money, and that never made sense to me. So I guess my question with that as a backdrop is, 
in getting the additional hit for Chelmsford, the 18%, was there a recognition of that situation? Is that part of the reason we got the extra money? The <clears throat> second or third or fourth look at the demographic data mm -hmm. was definitely part of okay. what happened. Good. Yes. Good. But um, I think that it is very likely that the excellent advocacy at the town level hopefully also at the state legislative level, um, helped lead to the result we have now and just keep working at it. Well, I probably don't have to tell you this because you've been in office long enough, but when something good happens, take the credit because when something <laughs> bad happens, they're going to hit you over the head with it. Okay? That, that so we have, to, sure. we have to have the balance here. That is for sure. I think that, that, is, that is fantastic, and I know that you had a lot to do with that. And I, and I really appreciate uh, the advocacy uh, on behalf of the town, and uh, I think uh, Jay Lang ought to send you a bouquet of roses, okay? That's just... Uh, <laughs> well, I'm seeing Superintendent Lang next week, so oh, I'll good. let him know that I expect yeah. roses. There you go. I, I, I think that that's entirely appropriate. Oh, that's, uh, that's great. I don't uh, think that's why I'm getting called into the meeting, though. <laughs> probably not. Probably not. So, well, that's certainly very good news. Uh, what, what other good... Uh, nuggets do you have for us, if anything? Well, we, we had a state budget mm -hmm. that we passed in late July, and I'm very pleased with what was in there, starting at the local level. Mm -hmm. um, Rep. Arciero, Rep. Elliott, and I were able to get substantial earmarks into the budget specifically for Chelmsford. That's something that all uh, legislators get to do or, or attempt to do. Mm. So we were able to get a new tactical vehicle for the Chelmsford Police Department, we were able to get a new lightning protection system for South Row Elementary School. We were able to get significant uh, additional funding on top of what we were already able to add statewide for the Councils on Aging into the uh, Senior Center hmm. uh, in Chelmsford for the Meals on Wheels program there. So um, those were some things we were able to accomplish locally. There were some other issues statewide that I think were things that I had heard a lot about um, uh, on, the, on the trail and certainly since being elected, one of which is the cost of child care. So we made a historic investment, $1.5 billion, into early childhood education and child care to try to tamper down those costs, mm -hmm. which a lot of the young families who are moving back to Chelmsford are, are really struggling with. Um, and, and so uh, we, we also made a a very significant additional investment in MBTA capital projects uh, in regional transit as well for this region, which is something that's much needed mm. for the entire greater Boston area. So there's a lot in the budget, happy to answer any questions. Um, but we also, right on the heels of that, had a big tax bill. Yes. We did our first tax cuts in a couple of decades. And, and, and folks, this is under a Democratic administration. I just want to make, I, I have to tell you, I'm flabbergasted. I mean, I, I, I didn't see that coming under Mara Healy. I just did not see that coming. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, I not, had to get that in there. Not at all. It, yeah. What's in here, this is good mm. stuff that's mm. in here. We have the uh, largest, the most generous uh, child independent tax credit mm -hmm. in the nation now. Uh, it's going to be over $400 within a couple of years per dependent. Um, so that includes uh, some huge. people have, you know, you know for, that yeah. includes minors, but it also includes older people, mm -hmm. um, uh, whether they're disabled or, or anybody else who qualifies as a dependent. Mm. Um, and we took it, uh, we took away the limitation. So it, before it was just a maximum of two people. Mm. Uh, now, now that's unlimited. We doubled the senior circuit tax breaker to $2,400 big for a lot of people That's huge. in Chelmsford. Mm -hmm. uh, we did something uh, which w was really overdue, which is that we uh, in doubled uh, the threshold for the death tax, the estate tax. Th that's what I'm talking about, because with all due respect, you don't typically see that kind of an action under a Democratic administration. Okay, and that's, that's what surprised me was, was I mean, you can argue that's probably an adjustment for inflation, yeah. okay? But, yeah. but still, I thought that was very significant, and, and I think it's justified, and I'm, I'm glad to see that. One of the things I'm learning about yeah. politics is sometimes in order to get anything done, you need to take, put a lot of things together. Sure. And so this was a compromise yeah. bill. There were a lot of different elements, mm -hmm. and 
there was something for everybody here. Exactly. And uh, the estate tax was part of that. You know, people in Chelmsford and around our district are seeing their property values go up and up and up mm -hmm. and up and up. Some of those people bought their houses for $80,000 yeah. and now they're approaching, you know, close to a million. They're asset rich and cash poor. And, and that's the problem. And it is punitive exactly. to have a $1 million threshold it is. as an estate tax. Mm -hmm. And we doubled that. Yes. And we also made it such that it's only the additional dollars mm -hmm. uh, above the threshold level that are being taxed, mm -hmm. which is a big change. So um, uh, those, were, those were really good things. The business community was behind this bill uh, in part because we, had, uh, we changed it to a, what's called a single factor sales tax. Mm -hmm. So uh, goods are taxed at the point of sale instead of from three different uh, vantage points, which both simplifies the tax code and that's will huge. reduce uh, corporate, yeah. I did, uh, corporate I did not, tax That payments. I did not know. That's, that's very significant. Yes. Yeah. So this was a big bill. Yeah. Um, and then we kept going. We, mm -hmm. The House recently passed a wage transparency bill, which uh, was a, another example of a lot of different stakeholders coming together. What this bill did uh, principally was that it's going to require businesses with 25 or more employees to post a salary range to applicants. And the reason that the business community, in addition to a lot of other stakeholders, were in favor of this was that there was very strong empirical dating sh data showing that women and minorities were hurt by the absence of that information on the front end mm -hmm. in terms of how much money they were making. And it was causing major discrepancies between the uh, amount of pay for the same work between women and men and minorities and non-minorities. Based on that data, a lot of businesses really wanted to do the same, the right thing mm -hmm. and be transparent. But that was much easier to do in a competitive economic environment if everybody was doing it. Correct, right. And so uh, AIM, the Association uh, Associated Industries of Massachusetts, came together with uh, wage groups and labor groups, and they agreed on this package. And it was a really strong bill. So uh, that came out of the Labor and Workforce Development mm -hmm. Committee, which I'm a part of, and that uh, also passed the House recently. I think, that, I think that's very good news. And, and this is a problem that has gone on forever. And uh, I remember many, many years ago when I got my first management position in a fairly large corporation and I suddenly had a bunch of people reporting to me. And I had eight people that were doing the same job, exactly yeah. the same job. And most of them had been in the job about the same amount of time. And most of them were, uh, you know, the, the same level of performance, okay? Mm -hmm. And yet the salaries were all over the place. And we had a couple of women in there who were down and we had a, another person who uh, was not meeting the salary scale. It took me three years, but I fixed that. But that's, you know, a manager can only fix what's in his or her department, okay? And I know there were other people in my company that had the same issue, and we all tried to make sure that there was parity. So I, I think that, you know, I mean, I know it sounds a little intrusive government, but the fact that, that, that small businesses backed that approach, I think, says an awful lot. And, and big businesses and, did, uh, yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I, I agree with yeah. it. That's, that's yeah. overdue, and I'm glad yeah. that happened. So that's, that's good news, okay? That is good news, you know? I mean, you have to treat people fairly, and that starts by being honest with them about whatever their situation is. So, yeah, that's great. Anything else? I don't know. I feel like uh, I feel like it's Christmas here, you know, for the state of Massachusetts and Chelmsford. <laughs> well, we had another vote yesterday. Okay. And this one is a little bit more controversial. Uh, I was proud, though, to mm -hmm. vote for the firearm safety bill that we had come to the floor yesterday. It's going to do quite a, a few things to modernize our laws around firearms. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in Massachusetts, we've, we've got the, the best rate of, of gun safety mm -hmm. and gun de deaths uh, in the country. And that is in very large part a product of uh, continue, continuing to look at our laws and make sure that uh, they're strong and also adhere to the constraints of the Second Amendment as are set out by mm -hmm. the U.S. Supreme Court. And as you know, Sam, there was a major decision, the Bruin decision just yes. last spring, that required us to go back 
and look at what we're doing as a state mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we're both in line with the constitutional requirements of the Second Amendment and also that we're uh, keeping up with technology. Right. Ghost guns are a major challenge mm -hmm. right now for uh, the entire country, including us in Massachusetts, both mm -hmm. the manufacture of them and the tracking of them. Mm -hmm. So this bill is going to address um, ghost guns, make sure that they are more traceable. Mm -hmm. Um, this bill is also going to expand uh, some of the ability to, to alert the authorities and who mm -hmm. can legally do that when somebody has uh, a firearm but is a danger to so themselves red flag or others. type situation. Yeah, extreme right. risk protection right. okay. orders. Um, this bill is going to uh, change how uh, gun dealers are licensed, mm -hmm. making sure that that is done equitably uh, and fairly mm -hmm. and transparently across the Commonwealth. And it's going to also uh, strengthen some of our data uh, reporting laws to make sure that we have the best mm -hmm. and strongest data so that we can continue uh, to do this in an informed manner. And, and, you know, it's interesting, and I'm glad you, you, uh, you talk about this because, of course, as we know, firearm, firearm ownership, Second Amendment, so this is all very emotional stuff. And people, a lot of times, don't take the time to really find out what's going on. And I, I read the uh, legislation, and, and I agree with most of it. And uh, for those people out there that are worried about this kind of thing, I can tell you this is not going to do anything to impede those people who want to be legal firearms owners and exercise responsibility. I'm going to tell you, it's a lot easier in this state. You're, you don't remember because you're too young. It's a lot easier in this state now to get a license to carry a firearm than it was 50 years ago. 50 years ago, probably 80% of your chiefs of police, they would just deny you outright. And, and what has happened over the years, I think there's become an awareness that the law-abiding people are not the problem, okay? So it, it's, you know, this bill really isn't going to affect 99% of uh, firearms owners in Massachusetts and those who want to be legal firearms owners. I think that's my interpretation of the bill. I completely agree. Yeah. And all, you know, mm -hmm. it was really interesting to learn how a lot of changes were made from the first iteration of this bill mm -hmm. that was presented over the summer to the second iteration. Yes. A lot of the advocates didn't know about many of those changes, mm -hmm. but it grandfathered in a lot of those yes. folks who have firearms now, right. whose firearms, uh, if they were created now, would not be, mm -hmm. uh, would be in violation, mm -hmm. but because they're grandfathered in or legacied in, mm -hmm. uh, they're not the new, for instance, live training requirement. Mm -hmm. When I learned that you didn't have to have live, live training, I was kind of surprised. You have to have live training to drive a car. Why not for a firearm? But I, uh, yeah, I've always, you, I've always thought that was a problem. But if you already have your license, then you, don't have, to, um, you don't have to engage in that. Mm -hmm. You're all set. Yeah, no, I, 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 I'm not uh, upset uh, with, with those changes. I think, I think they're entirely reasonable. And as long as they don't... Uh, um, impinge upon your ability to actually get a license if you want one, and I don't see that they do. I mean, again, it's, if you're law-abiding, you don't have a, a, a felony conviction record, and you don't have a mental history, uh, in this state, uh, in, you're, you're going to get your license. That was not true 50 years ago. I can tell you it was not. Okay, so And it wasn't true 200 years ago either. You know, it was, well, we, we've, had, we've right. had less and less restrictive over the centuries mm -hmm. Um, laws, and that was really interesting to learn about in the context of uh, constitutional mm -hmm. jurisprudence and right. how the Supreme Court looks at this now. They mm -hmm. do look to their history. That's one of the reasons that I'm very confident that this bill is going to pass muster if it goes up to the Supreme Court. That That's right. I, I, I agree with you. I think it probably will. All right. And so that's good. Uh, well, we have uh, about a minute left, Simon. So uh, what, tell us about the other 10 pieces of legislation that you're working on. <laughs> You know, Sam, I think, I think I'd say, first of all, if you're interested in what's happening now and you have questions about an issue area, a particular bill, you should reach out to my office. Mm -hmm. I have a constituent website up now, Sam. It's repcataldo.com. Oh, that has my phone number on it. It has uh, my office hours on it. It has my email address. I do have office hours coming up in Chelmsford at the Chelmsford Library. So at repcataldo.com, you can see all that information. The way I'm going to be able to do my job, Sam, is if I have constituent input. So 
I try to do that, get that affirmatively, but also it's a great help when people reach out and let me know uh, where they are on the issues and where they want my focus to lie. Great, and we're out of time. Perfect time to have to be a political career. Time is perfect. Thank you.